right? Because we have been in the prophecy of Isaiah, and we are up to chapter 42 uh, this morning, continuing our thoughts together with the prophet Isaiah. And uh, so I would like you to uh, open your Bibles if you've got them, follow along on your phones, whatever you use to read the Word of God nowadays. Now we're going to begin at verse 14. Verse 14, you remember last week uh, we talked about the chosen servant of God who was the Messiah and, and how uh, he was going to come and, and how God was foretelling that even years and years, centuries before he was to come. And if we ended there and we didn't have much time, but how we, we were to break forth in praise because of that. Stand on the mountaintops. Let the world know about this goodness of God. Now he's going to turn a corner a little bit here in uh, verse 14. So let's read verse 14 through the end of the chapter. This is God's holy word. Give it your attention. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation and I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are gods. Hear you deaf, and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? Strange language there. Stop and think about it for a minute. He sees many things but does not observe them. His ears are open but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. And they have become plunder with none to rescue, spoil with none to say, restore. Who among you will give ear to this and will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunders? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, in whose ways they would not walk and whose law they would not obey? So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the bite of battle, and it set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up but he did not take it to heart. Shall we pray? Father, open your, your understanding to us, for we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit and his work to uh, speak clearly from your word, to take it to our hearts, and to apply it to our lives, even though it's many centuries later here. May be fresh and true for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, uh, you know, I almost skipped this passage because that's your tendency, you know, skip the hard ones, the ones that have some, some language in them that are a bit confusing. And then when you drop down to that verse 19, you know, and it says, who is blind but my servant? Or deaf is my messenger whom I send. Who is blind is my dedicated one. Or blind as the servant of the Lord. And, and you ask yourself, what? I mean, we've just re been reading about the servant and in all of his clarity and greatness and goodness, the Messiah in the first part of chapter 42. And then we have the use of the servant of the Lord in a, a wholly different fashion there, like blind deaf. Relax, it's going to be okay. Because the prophet Isaiah uses the term the servant of the Lord 
for different designations. And that's what we have to understand is that he's not using, he's not talking about the same servant here at, in the latter part of the chapter as he was in the first part of the chapter. And the context uh, in, in, to help us understand that is look down to verse 22. But this people is plundered and looted. So what's happening, and that's why I said there was a corner that got turned here in verse 14, is now the prophet Isaiah is, is talking about the servant of the Lord, Israel. He uses actually probably three different uh, 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 ways in which he speaks about the servant of the Lord. He speaks about it as the Messiah. He speaks about it as Israel, who was to be the servant of the Lord. And sometimes even uh, he will speak of himself as the servant of the Lord. So the context helps us then now. Oh, now we can go back and look at this and say, who is blind but my servant? Not the Messiah, but his people. And of course, all we would have to do is read through the Old Testament, all through the Kings and the Chronicles, and we would see right away the blindness, the deafness of the people of God at times to the voice of God in their midst there. So it, 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 it helps us to, again, look at the context and understand the prophet there. But let's drop back. We'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but let's drop back to verse 14 then where uh, it says this. For a long time I have held my peace and I have kept still and restrained myself. This is God talking via the prophet in, in his, in, 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 in first person here. And what a statement that is. God holding his peace, God restraining himself. We don't think of God in those terms. We think of God as, as just marching through, doing whatever he wants to do all the time. And there is a sense, of course, in which he does that. But part of his marching through the universe and part of his, his work in the universe is that he restrains himself. And I'm really glad he is, does that, beloved. Because if he doesn't restrain himself at times, what would happen to you? And what would happen to humanity in general if he was not patient and long-suffering? What would have happened to the people of Israel had he not been patient and long-suffering with them? He would have certainly had to just destroy them all. And there were times when he was even on the verge of doing that. Remember out there in the desert when, when he said to Moses, just get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to destroy them all. I'm going to start all over with you. And Moses had to fall on his face before the Lord and plead that he wouldn't destroy the people for his own namesake and glory. And then he relented. He restrained himself there. And he'd been restraining himself for many we might even say centuries as, as Israel went down and went down and went down and, and worshipped the idols off and on again so many times. But he's so gracious and merciful that he restrained himself. And I, I, I'm not prophetic, so I can't say where he has restrained himself in your life, but I am sure. That it has been the same for you too. That there are moments in all of our lives in which we deserved his wrath and punishment upon us. But like here in the prophet Isaiah, God restrained himself and instead brought salvation. And that's what, what this uh, first part of the passage is about. He's going to break forth. But it's going to be a breaking forth in a, in a confusing sort of manner because he's going to break forth in judgment and in salvation at the same time. But that's the way God works in this world, beloved. That he'll break forth and, and, and uh, 
Sometimes the lines are not so neat for us. He breaks out and, and, and pours out horrific things upon the world and sometimes in people's lives. And at the same time that he's doing that, he is working a great salvation. Sometimes in those very same people. Now he uses real colorful language. Language that I wouldn't have used about God, but uh, he's the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah. But he says, look, I've kept myself, I've restrained myself, and now I will cry out like a woman in labor. Those of you who have had children know what that's like. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills. I'll dry up all their vegetation. I'll turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know and paths that they have not known. I will guide them. And I will turn the darkness before them into light and rough places into level ground. These things I do and I do not forsake them. So even though it's going to be this terrific outburst, and I believe it probably in the context of Isaiah, that includes the captivity into Babylon, the destruction of this temple and the city, the ruination of their all that they'd ever worked for. It goes up in, in flames and dust there, and they are carried away into the land. And yet, God says, in this outburst, it's not all judgment. I will not forsake them. I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light. This is the merciful God who even when he finally can't restrain, in, in, in the imagery of the passage, when he can't restrain himself anymore and it just bursts out all over the place, it's not going to be total destruction. At the same time, he's going to guide the blind. He's going to bring light. He's not going to forsake his people. But I think there's a, 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 just maybe another lesson here too is that don't mistake God's patience for his inability. He could have burst out at any time, okay, but he's patient. That doesn't mean he's not able. And I think there's a principle there that we need to, to learn and grow in too. And that is that we wait upon God for his timing. I mean, I look at our land today for, for one, one thing and I say, what a horrible place it is becoming <clears throat> to be to live in the United States of America. Not that it's not good in some respects, but... You know, the moral decay and the, the problems of society are so great. And, and you want to say, God, take your sickle and do something, you know. Burst out, mash the mountains, you know. Dry up the rivers, do what needs to be done in a land in which there's so much wickedness prevalent. And we kind of almost say, God, well, aren't you able to do this? He is able. Well, we don't know his timetable always. And so we don't want to mistake his patience for inability. He can break out in the United States of America today, tomorrow, next week, in a month, in a year. We, we have to wait upon his perfection. I mean, that's what happened in the life of Israel. Finally, the time came and he burst out in judgment and in mercy at the same time there. Well, what was the purpose of this uh, uh, action on the part of God? Well, it was for the purpose of salvation. The blind are led into the light. They, the people are not forsaken there. The people are guided. So, so they're, they're, as I said, it's this kind of mixture together of a stream. Judgment, salvation at the same time. But it's, but it's salvation in the way of truth. And I think that's what the next part of the passage 
explains to us here that salvation always, it may be accompanied by judgment and mercy, but it is always in the way of truth. And so you have in verse 17, again, uh, just a brief comment of the prophet saying, look, they turn their back and, <coughs> and are utterly put to shame who trust in the carved idols, who say to the middle images, you are our God. You'll never find salvation outside of the truth and outside of the one true God. You won't find it in, in self-help or psychology or you won't find it in Buddha or Islam or, or whatever multitude of gods that are around there. Uh, <coughs> you have to give up your idols, God says, if you really want to be saved. There. Uh, verse 17 not with the idols, verse 18 through 20, not in a way of ignorance as well. Hear you deaf, look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf is my messenger whom I send? Who is blind is my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things but does not observe them. His ears are open but he does not hear. You have to have the right heart if you want to be saved by God. You have to have a, a heart that is, is open to listening to God. You have to have ears that want to hear the word of God. See, that was the problem in Israel. They had a lot of information. I mean, what other nation in the history of the world had the amount of information that Israel did? They... We're at the mountain. God came down and spoke out loud to them. And then he wrote it down on stone tablets. And he gave them all the prophets. And, and, and over and over again, he was speaking to his people, but they blocked their ears to him. And that's why he uses such graphic language there. Look, who is as blind as my servant or deaf as the messenger of whom I send? I mean, you are, this is a, this is a, I don't know, if I'm looking for the right expression here. This is a guilty sort of blindness, you know. You might say, well, there's natural blindness and but for Israel, it's like you poked your own eyes out. You wouldn't you wouldn't see the mighty working of God around you. You wouldn't hear the mighty voice of God around you. And therefore, he uses such graphic language about them. You, you see many things, but you don't observe them. You don't take them to heart. They don't mean anything to you. Your ears hear the prophets, but they don't, but they don't hear them. They don't bring them to heart. We know that... That's what God's talking about here because he said the Lord was pleased for his righteousness, righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. He, the prophet is referring us back to that experience of Israel. Nowhere else in the world had the word of God come but to Israel. I mean, it hadn't come to Assyria it hadn't come to Babylon. It hadn't come to, you can name all the places of the ancient world, to Egypt. They were all in the darkness without word. But to Israel, God had given his law. And therefore, they were in, inexcusable in light of such privilege. Uh, Jeremiah uh, puts it in chapter 6 and verse 15 in this way. Let me read it for you. Jeremiah 6 and verse 15 says this. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. 
They did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown. They were so in such, so ignoring what God had done in their midst that they weren't even ashamed about it anymore. They couldn't even blush, he said. And therefore judgment comes from God. <clears throat> and that's what we see happening again then in, four, in chapter 42 where it says here, but this people is a people plundered and looted and they are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons and have become plunder with none to rescue. They are spoiled with none to say restore. But then comes the question, who among you will give ear to this? And who will listen for the time to come? Again, it's that, that weaving together of judgment and salvation right in the midst of this very realistic picture of Israel in their deafness and their blindness. God reaches down, he's looking down and he's saying, but some of you will listen to this. Some of you will be repentant. Some of you will have ears that are opened and eyes that see so that you won't be destroyed. You see, there's a special desperation that awaits those who stray from the light. See, these weren't just the ordinary nations. These, this was the nation that had the light and they strayed from it. And because of that, they're, they're described as plundered, looted, trapped in holes, hidden in prisons, become plunder with no one to rescue. Now, how would we apply that today? Well, we have to apply that to the church, beloved. The church is the place where the truth has been preached and is being preached. Beware then that lest you cast the light behind your back in some way. Lest you ignore the, vo the voice of God in your midst because you'll be like these people then here. Plundered, looted, hiding out in the holes. There's a there's a, a, a sort of judgment that comes upon people who have the light there. And so be warned as the people of God. Never go away from the truth. Never stop your ears from what God is saying. Lest this kind of fate befall you. And you're saying, well, preacher, you, you know, why are you saying that to us why are you saying that because the scriptures make note of that look at listen to revelation chapter 3 verse 17 who's he talking to he's talking to the churches and he says for you say i am rich and i have prospered and i have need nothing not realizing that you are wretched pitiful poor blind and naked I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire and on and on. It goes there in Revelation. God warns the churches too. Warns his people because he knows humanity. We're so fickle. It's so easy for us to turn away from the truth and to go into other paths. And that's what had happened in Isaiah's day. And so his warning comes down to us. Instead... Let's have the attitude of the psalmist. And with these, these uh, verses, I close from Psalm 139. And verse 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me 
and lead me into the way everlasting. Search out this tendency to wonder. Search out this tendency to question your truth and lead me on into the way everlasting. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Isaiah's prophecy. As uh, stark as it is, and yet you'll use your word to keep us upon the way that our foot might not stumble, that we might go forward with you. And Lord, uh, may we not be blind and deaf servants, but true servants of you in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.